with for you guys. So we've oh we're live on YouTube now. Hey guys. Hey guys. Um, we thought we'd come online and speak to everyone since it's uh, you know it's Black Friday coming up. We yep. thought we'd uh, tell you a little bit more about some of our deals that we've got going on. Uh, discuss a little bit about the year that we've had. Uh, discuss the latest uh, results. Like what about for example what happened in uh, uh, the O2 finals in yep. London uh, with Dimitrov winning. Um, and just to speak to you guys and uh, find out a little bit more about what you guys enjoyed yep. uh, in the year. If you've learned anything new from us, if there's anything that you'd like to learn from us, uh, this is the live session for that. So Simon, what do you think about the O2 final? Who do you think should have won? Do you think the right man won? And earlier we had some questions uh, asking whether you think that uh, Dimitrov deserved it. Well, I think Goffin really deserved to get to the final. Yeah. Played incredible. After losing to Dimitrov in that second match, 6-love, six 6-2, love, six he really came back and, and done really well. Um, I think a fresher Goffin would have given a better match in the final. I think the third set, he kind of got a bit tired down there. But uh, Dimitrov, he played really well. It would have been good to see Federer come yeah. through and win because he's had probably, for me, he's had the best year. I know that Nadal has also done so well and he's, he's won all the events, but Federer has also had an incredible year. Hi, do you do practice sessions and if yes, how do you book one? Uh, send us an email if uh, we can yep. make it happen, we'll definitely try and make it happen. We are thinking about organizing um, some kind of camps, so yep. uh, a trip away where we can take some of you guys and work with you one-on-one -on -one and in a group environment, hopefully change your game, some of the things that you've been struggling with. Um, but yeah, we're, we're definitely looking to do that more. Could you do more interviews with professional players? Something that we definitely uh, are thinking about and hopefully next year we'll travel to more events and we'll be able to, to ask that, the players yeah. questions. What would you guys like to see from us in 2018? Any stroke that you struggle with in particular? Any part of your game? need help on the serve uh, yeah well yeah. Uh, we, we have a few uh, videos on serve that you can check out from our uh, uh, channel so yeah. we, if you type in the tennis server top tennis training I'm sure you can find a few there we also have a, a tennis course uh, which goes a little bit more in depth um, and uh, yeah you can also check that out I don't know if it's available to yeah. view right now but if you sign up to our list we will be yeah. um, able to uh, email you when that becomes available what the more are you guys playing? They're going a bit too quick. How many rackets does a player, tennis player need? Well, depends, uh, depends, depends your on level. your level. Yeah. yeah, so if you're breaking a lot of strings and you're going for, uh, like going to a tennis tournament, you probably need a few rackets with you. Like I used to travel with between four and six rackets um, and you know some of the top guys they travel probably with at least eight rackets yeah uh, again it depends where you're going so if I'm going for altitude or uh, where potentially maybe if I'm taking a long plane journey my strings might lose tension uh, I'll need a lot of um, uh, I need a, a few more rackets so that I could play around with the tensions especially at the beginning of the tournament until I get used to a certain tension that I like um, I'm not, I wasn't a player that was breaking a lot of rackets, so I, I didn't need it for that. But I think it's definitely to do with string tensions. Um, and especially if you're breaking a lot of strings, like on clay, you may need a few rackets because a stringer might not always be able to restring your racket on the spot. spot. Yeah. So we've had a few more questions here. Slow balls, I've been told that I whip almost too much and need to hit flatter through the ball before I'm, s but I'm still not getting it. So, I mean, if, if we have the video on the short balls, how to yeah. kill short balls, so you can check that out on, our, on the uh, channel. Yeah. But in terms of if you're whipping it up too much, try to get to the ball earlier, so before it's dropping below the height of the net, and then you'll be able to flatten the ball out much more and still get it in. So really try to get up to the ball quickly and hit through the ball a bit more. In terms of like the technique part, or if you are hitting, making the ball topspin a lot, you're gonna to have to uh, level out your path a lot. So you're gonna to yep. have to hit a straighter path. Um, again, it, might, it has to depend on your um, racket face. Carlos, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing our best, guys. It's uh, great to have you guys on board yep. and watching our videos. That's what drives us, that's what keeps us going. That's why we do these things, yep. uh, you know, and if you have had uh, any good experiences if you've learned anything or any kind of moment that you you know we were able to help you always let us know 
because yeah for us uh it's it means a lot you know yeah. we we do put out a lot of uh um, stuff out there content for you guys and we put a lot of effort into it yeah. to help you guys so it means a lot when it uh you know it pays when, off for some people when so. we get those good emails saying how we've transformed someone's game it gives us the motivation to even do better we've got a high one-handed backhand so we have a whole course with tommy robredo on the single-handed backhand so i don't know if it's yeah so the high one-hander we have a video on that as well so go and Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you yep. haven't done already and also subscribe to our emails there You'll get all the the latest videos we send to the email list sometimes videos that we don't release on YouTube Yeah, or on Facebook or Instagram So that's where to go sign up for the free videos with Sam Groff. Yeah, and you'll get our emails every week That's the best way to do it and uh, when you do get emails from us. You can always reply to them yep. We do read them where well, we do try and uh, Answer respond as to as many as we can uh, and if there is a particular uh, something that you're struggling with, we can always try and uh, film a video on that for you. Where do you teach? We teach in London right now, but next year we are planning to travel and we hope to visit a lot of countries. How to get into the flow state before faster. the match. So that would be coming under the tactics courses that we have. Yeah. Uh, definitely sign up for the, the free emails that we send out every week. And there you'll get all our latest tips. I think in terms of like getting yourself ready for the match, I think for me personally, like it was, um, I was one of these players that needed some time off before I play. So I didn't want to like get rushed and come on the court and actually play because I, I wouldn't feel ready. So I always kind of took like 20 minutes before I play to actually uh, calm my nerves and, 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 and think about and when what... You say did you do that alone? Was that yeah, like somewhere yeah, on so, your own? Yeah, so, I, so I'd, I'd go off by myself. I wouldn't yeah. want anyone around because that's distractions for me. So for me, I always decided to write, that's 20 minutes of me, my own time, which um, I actually think about what I'm going to do in the match. Yeah. I go through one, my tactics, and one, uh, whether um, like all the possibilities that might happen in the match. So if, for example, my backhand's not working, I might, you know, I'll be thinking, what can I do to counter that? Yeah. And then just before I go on the court, I'll kind of, envision myself playing really well i'll yep. kind of remember some of my good points uh some of the good results that i've had and then that's kind of when i'd go on and i always try and warm up well as well so if you're if you're warmed up if you've got your body temperature up you're always going to be uh a, a, a lot quicker in you know getting in and you know uh, getting off to a good start in the match i think that's important hey from moscow hello from london thanks guys for tuning in uh share this link the best what's the best forehand on the ATP circuit oh I'd say probably F Federer I'd pick me, Federer. Federer a lot of Del Potro has yeah. probably the fastest the, I'd the say quickest um, but I don't know how good it is for someone's wrist Rafa obviously has the most kind of spin and yeah, it's the, the most, most difficult yeah. uh, on clay I'd say is definitely Rafa um, I think he's yeah his forehand you know the way it comes off the court it's a he miss soddling yeah, I mean, he's, uh, he's been out for a while yeah. now, yeah. We um, won't say anything more about Sutherland, because yeah. we'll keep that a secret, but um, I want very bad in finishing volleys. So you, you're struggling with the volleys. Um, we have a lot of videos on the volleys as well, but main things that I notice on people struggling at the net, they swing too much, they don't use the right footwork, and they don't close the net down. So focus on those things, and you'll be okay. One second guys, I'll be right back. Sorry guys, I think Simon's just had to leave to talk to someone. Um, so it's just me for now, hey. Uh, so yeah, I can answer any of your questions. Let me just have a look if I miss it. Uh, Nashit, I missed your comment. I, there was quite a few comments and I think I missed it. I'm trying to look back, but I can't. There's quite a few comments. What string sh tension do you play with right now? Uh, I, play, I play with 50 pounds uh, in my racket. I, when I used to play, I was playing with 50. I started with 62, then I dropped down to 60, then I went to 58. Uh, eventually, I went down to 54. And now when I'm coaching, I coach with 50 because I think it kind of saves the arm as much as possible and it also allows me to generate easier power um, however I find that I need to play with the vibration damn in order to still control the ball and I feel like 
when you get the tension too loose, your strings tend to vibrate quite a lot and move around a lot. So if I don't play with the vibration down, I find it vibrates a bit too much. So that's what I do. Then you also find it's the strings because some strings will, will move more. So for me, I use 46 pounds, 48 pounds. Now it's winter time here, it's very cold. So I use a looser string so that I still get easy power. Um, but the, the string definitely has a huge impact on the tension. The tighter the string is, so a polyester string, it doesn't move that much when it's being strung. And a more natural gut, it will move quite a lot, so you have to actually string it tighter. Have you guys ever played with a... No, we haven't, I haven't tried that string. No, Selinko, no, I haven't tried that string. Uh, would, would someone ask, what parts of the body do you think we should train? Uh, which are the to most important for tennis. tennis. Um, I'd say, well, the legs, obviously, you have yeah. to get to the ball. Very important to train the legs. Your core, because yeah. you're going to have to, once you get to the ball, you have to be balanced. Generating and you have to the be power able, from the yeah, core. Yeah, exactly. Generate the power from the core. Um, and I'd say, like, a lot of shoulder rotation. So yeah. a lot of rotational. Uh, the things you see the guys, like Rafi does a lot of this, just to prevent the injuries on serve. Yeah. And yeah. also the back, I'd say. I'd say yeah. the back is, tennis players tend to have very strong chest because everything is, frontal based yeah whereas you have to almost help the posture by doing a lot of back stuff so a lot of back exercises how to beat a server by having a great return yeah <laughs> learning from david nalbandian <laughs> managing anger um well Ooh, i guess I'd say, yeah I, that's why you have what would you say for so for me when i got angry and i did sometimes it's very important to take time in between points yep. to reset yourself and not let yourself kind of get down a, a, a spiral where you know it kind of builds on you. You have to kind of reset after every point and start every point afresh. And Rafa said yep. that before. You know, he plays every point like it's his first. And uh, you know, sometimes it's easier said than done. But yep. it, that time where the player goes to the uh, the towel to wipe their face and 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 take a like a little time out to get the balls. That's the time that they use to reset. And I think that's important in order to kind of feel fresh when you're stepping, stepping up to the line and not let anger affect you. I also think that a, a huge thing about anger, I noticed that some of my players, they struggle when they get tired and when their blood sugar starts to drop, the anger affects them a lot more. So I always try to keep my players uh, with good levels of energy. So always eating bananas during training, drinking the energy drinks while they're training, things like Gatorade in the States. Those kind of things keep your blood level, your blood sugar level more neutral and keeps it high so you don't actually get that frustrated. And tennis exercises. Okay, we'll think about that one. How do you get power on your shots with a weak wrist? Um, well, I think it's all about using your body using a lot more. So lot. using the, uh, the, the power that comes from the turning of the body. So you've got your rotational momentum that you generate from the turn, the, the shoulders separating from the hips. You've got your momentum going into the shot. So the more weight transfer you have into the shot, the better it's going to be for you, the better, the less you're going to have to use the small segment like your wrist. Uh, and, and definitely trying to keep, uh, don't hold the racket too tight because the tighter you hold the racket, the more, the more strain you're going to have on that wrist. So keep the, don't hold the racket too tight and use the big segments. I think that's uh, the best idea. How do I beat a lefty server? I'd say move, take that best serve away from them. Move slightly, especially on the outside, move slightly more into the tram lines, make them go down the tee. Yeah. And then just play, play mind games with, with the lefties. Change position where you're, you're standing to return. Move in, move back, move to your right, move to your left. Give them different options. Give them something different to think about. Yeah, you definitely have to adjust your positioning on that wide serve. Because they have that slice serve into your backhand, you definitely have to stand a lot wider, not just to show them that you, you know they're going to stand there, but actually if they do serve, that you're still able to reach it because that slider uh, out wide is very important for them, especially, you know, it's a big part of their game. What do you guys think about the 25 second time clock in between serves? I think it's a good idea. Yeah. It actually keeps the action going. Yeah. For a player like Rafa, it's gonna have a huge impact because he likes to take longer. He likes to get his heart rate coming down to the optimum between 120 and 140. But for the, for the people who are actually watching, they wanna see tennis and they wanna see it quicker. So for the, for the spectators, it's better. For certain players, it's much worse. Guys, just, uh, just as a quick little, uh break can you please share this video yeah uh as much as you can because obviously we'd like to help more of you out there we'd love to have more people joining the discussion uh seeing our videos obviously that you know drives us that's what 
helps us do more videos for you guys. So if you can share it, if you can like it, obviously sharing with uh, any of your tennis friends or on your wall and Facebook, uh, things like that will definitely help us to uh, grow and to bring more videos like this to you. So if you haven't done so already, please do that right now. So yep. share that, share the video, share and then, the link, and, and then and then come back with, to us, and then uh, we'll carry on. Yep. Okay, so I'm interested in learning about fitness workout from tennis beginners. Okay, yeah, so we're gonna do uh, uh, we're fitness in the process course, yeah. of working on the fitness course um, with uh, some of the best fitness coaches in tennis uh, and putting our own knowledge, things that we have worked on in order to get our games better. And we're gonna put that into a course for you very soon. So if you haven't done so already, subscribe to our uh, channel. Well, subscribe to our list, so our email list. Go onto our website. Any of the courses that you see, any of the we asked you for the email. If you subscribe to that you'll receive our emails um, and hopefully you know soon we're gonna release that course for you. Jack, how are you doing buddy? Best practices for a kick serve and somebody said why is the kick serve so tough to learn? I think the reason it's so tough to learn is one, you have to throw the ball behind you which for some people is actually a little bit awkward, it's a bit yep. tough to hit from behind you. Uh, you have to generate quite a lot of racket head speed in order to generate topspin so it, your wrist has to be involved quite a lot and you have to have the correct technique in order to generate that speed of the racket. So I think a lot of players prefer that the flat or the slice because the ball is a little bit more in front of them yep. and it requires a little bit less work so I think uh, that's why the, the kick service it, it's a tougher serve to learn even for pros sometimes like for me for example when I haven't served that serve for a while and I come out and someone says do a kick right now the first few I don't quite connect perfectly you know and then I and then I, I practice a few and then all of a sudden I start getting the right shape uh, and letting that ball kind of bend and uh, and kick up so it's a it's a serve that you need to practice in order to get better and it's one that what would you say are the biggest things about the kick serve? For me, I always think about that clock face, going from eight o'clock to two o'clock. If the ball was a clock, best tennis channel apparently. Thank you guys. Thanks guys, appreciate it. it means so, a lot to so, us. So that clock again, you're going from eight o'clock to two o'clock or seven to one, and once you get that feeling of going from under the ball upwards and across the ball, that's when you can really develop the kick serve. What about you, Alex? What do you think are the, the keys to a good kick? Well, actually, somebody just asked here, how do you prevent um, hip pain um, and how do you prevent back or hip pain on a kick serve? And this is something that what I think is very important on a kick serve as well yep. is a lot of people forget that when you throw that ball up, a lot of people actually bend backwards with their back. And what you want to try and do is to actually bend backwards with your legs. So you want to go down. It's almost like doing a limbo under the ball where it's not you're not really bending, bending the back backwards. but you're just kind of you're leaning back through your legs and that will help one save your back uh, and two actually give you a little bit more power as you extend and you come out of it so your legs exactly. are going to be much more involved is diet a big factor in playing good tennis um 100 percent. i think i think uh, to an extent i think yeah. uh, players that are playing a lot of hours on the court they need to eat a lot of food you know you need, need to, the calories. you need the calories for your body i think eating the right things like eating too much fat and yeah. and, and and foods that are not particularly useful i think you you actually do need fat because your body burns fat when you when you're working out when you're playing well, tennis. healthy fat exactly not so it's, McDonald's you need diet. to have a, a, a good balance to your to your diet but you know certainly needs to be a lot of it backhand question one train a week to achieve a high junior ranking do you give lessons around the world? Uh, we are thinking about making some clinics uh, yep. that we can travel around and actually uh, see some Doing of you guys, see some person. of you in person, try and help you on your game. Uh, and we're going to be organizing those uh, very soon. So uh, if you haven't done so already, subs well, subscribe to our website so we can send you that, that email and that's where you, you're going to be able to join us. Where would you guys like us to come and visit? Which country are you based in? And where would you like us to hold up those clinics? Where would you be able to travel to? to attend them. What about comments, common injuries like tennis elbow and golfer's elbow? So I think any kind of injury that you're getting, um, it's, it's one could happen from overusing uh, yep. that certain area. So you want to spread the load with, into the other areas. So if I'm using my arm too much that, and, I'm, and I'm too tight, too tense when I'm hitting my shots, I'm gonna develop elbow injuries. So therefore I need to use more my shoulder, my rotation, and definitely try and stay relaxed. The more exactly. relaxed you are in tennis, the easier it is to hit the shot, the easier it is to generate power, um, and the, the better you're gonna hit that shot. So 
um, I'd say definitely use those use the rotation of the body and try and flow through the shots a lot more players that are tense and, and try and generate power through their arm uh, they uh, they tend to get injured a lot more we keep getting one question I'm just gonna read it can I become a pro tennis player I'm 22 and I started playing tennis at 20 that's hard I think that's I think almost... you're, you're, I think you're starting from uh, a really big handicap because yeah. a lot of those players start at the age of three, four. You know, exactly. so you're you're years behind where you kind of want to be um, at your age. There's no reason why you can't get good enough and and get onto the pro circuit. I think yeah. you could, you know, with a few years uh, of training and really specific training. If you have a good coach that can work with you, perhaps you could get onto uh, onto the rankings. But uh, if you wanted to make a, a living out of it and be a top hundred player, I'd say it's a very tough thing to do at the age of if you're just starting 20 and yeah. 20 and picking up the rack in fact i don't know any players that have done it so no. you'd be the first you'd be the first so there's yeah. not, not to say that you can't do it it just means it's a it's a real challenge and you know you're going to have to work very hard in order to do that can i go pro after college i think it's a very good idea yeah and i think it's one of those things that it's happening more because the average age of the top 100 is actually getting older year on year it's getting older so now the average age is 26 and I think it will probably end up going up to 27. Does the kick serve need to be behind your head? Yes. 100% because you have to hit the ball from left to right if you're a right-handed player. You cannot get a good kick serve if you're throwing the ball in front and you're trying to hit it just in that normal flat or slice uh, ball toss position. If you think about it, a kick serve when you, when you are hitting it, the ball hit has to leave your racket and go up. So it's, it's like a curve, it's a, it's a, it's a lob serve. So if you're throwing the ball in front or to the right, in order to throw your racket up is actually impossible. So you can only do so when it's behind you and throw it up across, rather than if you're there, it's, it's impossible to, to, to reach forward and make that ball topspin up. Uh, so you, you do need to throw it uh, behind you, yes. So strategy for a big server, I would say really shorten the backswing, try to use the pace off the serve and try to just get the, the first serve in, try to block it back in, and get yourself back in a neutral position in the point. So someone just said um, they're 15 and they've started playing tennis at the age of nine. What kind of tournaments can they play? I think you wanna play tournaments that are of your level. So play yeah. as many tournaments as you can where you can compete and you can and start- preferably local, sorry. Yeah, yeah, so you can start getting results. You know, you, you wanna get good within your area, then your city, then you become national. So start playing national tournaments and then hopefully if you're good enough, then uh, play some international tournaments. Yep. But definitely as many tournaments as you can play will help you develop that you know the match tactics that you'll need and get you good at winning points because some players they actually train uh, and they they think they're really good and they they, they, they go become to a they become yeah. good ball strikers but they're not good tennis players a, a good tennis player is a player that can win matches right it's a player that can uh, you know win against a different type of opponent exactly in different conditions with a different score line uh, and can actually adapt. manage adapt to their own weaknesses and strengths and so there, there is a lot to being a tennis player, not just uh, hitting a tennis ball, you know, cross court, for example. What is the best surface for counter punches? Ooh, I would say probably so hard court. Yeah, I'd say clay yeah. is more of a grinder's game, yeah, isn't it? It's clay is. I'd say hard court. Hardcore, yeah. I mean, a counter puncher can play on every surface. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a slightly, you know, you're, a counter puncher is someone who takes the pace of the opponent and and uses it to redirect the ball yeah. and, and and stay in the point. So. Um, you know, who is a counter puncher, right? So would you call someone like Murray a counter puncher? If he's a counter puncher, look, you know, he's able to win on all surfaces. Um, you know, is, is, is someone like Rafa a counter puncher? I don't know, you know, someone like Hewitt maybe I think was a counter all, puncher. Yeah, I think and, and, he, and he won on grass a lot, you know, exactly. so things like that. So it all depends on what kind of surface the player prefers. And almost every top player can almost play any style of game. They, they're not classed as just a big server, like Federer, has a good serve, he places it well, he's also got a great forehand, he's also a great defender, so he has many tools in his bag to win with, and it's something that every player that I always coach, and, and Alex does the same, we always try to develop the whole court game, so you can defend, you can be in a neutral position, you can also attack, you can come to the net to finish points at the net with volleys, so it's something to develop, don't try to play one game style, but really develop one game style as your base, but then builds from there. So someone just asked, um, when I played against Federer, what was the one thing that I noticed that was different to him uh, compared to other players? Well, um, I found that he, 
he's one of these players that can hit the ball very hard with, with what looks like very little effort you know so he's very loose in how yeah. he hits the ball and the ball comes through and it bounces up quite a lot at you so I found that I had to work very hard with my footwork to try and kind of stay in the rallies with him um, I think he uh, he can really switch on uh, the power and the kind of uh, he can take the ball on very quickly out of nowhere so you could be rallying 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 and then all of a sudden he's just got that extra gear that he can just switch to and just hit that little bit harder and you're like wow where did that come from where you almost didn't see him kind of line up for it or wind up something extra but he's just able to kind of accelerate through contact when he needs to and and he seems to get a lot of balls in as well you know when he needs yeah. to get it you know he doesn't really miss so many no but actually something that i did notice is sometimes he would miss you know because he would just because he would be loose and he'd miss one but then he'd just come back straight away and and the next like few he'd he'd really focus on and he wouldn't miss again so i think something to take away from that for some of the players is you know i see a lot of uh, you know when when players are practicing they start missing and then it kind of continues you know yeah. that you need to be able to reset and and analyze what's happening and be able to then you know snap back into uh, into uh, not missing you know because at the end of the day you have to, uh, to in order to win the match you can't be missing balls so uh, he's very good at that what level coaches are you guys so i'm a level four senior performance coach here in the uk uh, also hold rpt national professional qualification and alex is yeah. a level five master performance coach so so that's like the, the that's the top coaching yeah. qualification that you can get uh, in in britain yeah. um and it's yeah it's taken me many years to get like the the last one was two years just for of studying and it was quite brutal i had to do a, a lot of work for yeah. it and but it was actually very fun so i got to learn a lot of new things new concepts and it made me aware of uh, a lot of things and i actually had to do a lot of research for it which uh, is now helping me uh, actually help you guys out there because of uh, of that work that i've done aiming to coach a pro player would you like to coach a pro player I think so. I think I'd enjoy it. I think yep. I'd really like it. Um, I think uh, the the only challenge would be the the travel, you know. Yeah, uh, constant travel. Um, so we'd have to, I don't know. We'd have to see what where you know our business is going. Yep. See if we could, you know, how much time we can take off. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be fun to actually travel, and we could maybe film on the road. Maybe Vlog. someone could come yep. along. Uh, so yeah, it could be it could be interesting. Uh, um, yeah, we both I think would work. Uh, yeah. With with a with a pro player, hundred percent. Is this guy's well at the moment we we coach part-time we do some coaching with some players but yep. we're trying to make this more of a full-time thing yes so eventually i think from ne from next year we're looking to do this a lot more uh, so we'll see how it goes yeah pinpoint or platform stands is better um what do you think you serve platform and i, I serve use, pinpoint yeah so. and I've, I've used pinpoint and i think first serve uh, for pinpoint i definitely got more pop definitely got more power yeah but second serve i lost the kick I just couldn't get the kick serve with the pinpoint, so I went back to platform simply for my second serve. But also, my lower back started to ache, but probably because of uh, me arching my back quite a lot inside the court. Mm. But uh, for me, platform works, and for you, pinpoint works. Pinpoint, I think yeah. you have to try both, test out both, and see which one you prefer. For me, I find that. Um when I use platform, I, I find it tough to get into the core. Like I like to transfer my body for weight forward and jump into the core. Um, and uh, that's, that's why I use uh, the pinpoint. You know, I find that it gives me the most power. Whereas, you know, some players that got used to it from a young age, perhaps for them, it would be a, a little bit easier to do. So, um, yeah, I think if you're trying to get more power, I'd say pinpoint would probably be a, an be easier better. one to yeah. do. You know, you, uh, I think uh, most of the, like a lot of the players use pinpoint. Um, there's that, there are a few that are good for platform as well. It's a slightly different technique and it's something that we go into in some of our videos and you can check those out. Um, but yeah. Why does Nadal struggle indoors? I'd say he's grown up on clay. He's got the kind of a game where he kind of needs time. So when he goes indoors on a faster surface, he doesn't have that time. He likes to play quite far back. And I think that's the biggest reason. Plus his serve, at one point his serve was a real weapon. In 2010, he changed his technique. Uh, he had a really good serve, but now his serve is starting to struggle again. So one guy asked, uh, he's 16, and how often should he go to the gym and how often should he play? I'd Depends say, what you want to do. Yeah, yeah, like I'd say play as much tennis as you can. Uh, I, I was playing probably between two and three hours a day, if you yeah. can, um, and then one hour gym. 
that hour gym you can you can kind of do different things on different days. So you can have a leg day, you can have a cardio day, you can have an upper body day, uh, you can, and obviously always try and do injury prevention work, whether it's uh, bands or stretching and things like that. So gym is not always just about the building of muscle as such or doing heavy weights. It's also to do with um, you know maintaining your body and helping it not break down. How far? How fast do you guys hit your forehands? How fast? So stay you... consistent in rallies. There's a misconstrued place for hitting, not building points. Do you guys? So for me, I mean, I don't know. I've never measured my speed as such, yeah. but I think what's important is to accelerate through the, the the shot. So a lot of players, if you if you're trying to make the ball and you're trying to push the ball into the court, I think that's the wrong way, the wrong mentality of doing exactly. things. So you have to go for it, but the, the, the safety comes from the top spin and the top spin comes from a fast racket head speed. Therefore, you have to actually accelerate and hit faster in order to be safer. It's just how much through the shot you're hitting and how much up on the shot you're hitting is what's going to determine of that kind of uh, risk versus reward. If I risk it and I hit flat, yes, I might hit a, a faster shot, but I might miss. And if I hit a bit of topspin, it's going to go slightly slower because the energy is going to be transferred into the rotation of the ball. Therefore, uh, and it's going to be safer. So the, the safer shots are usually the ones that I'm going for kind of angles and rallying balls. And the flatter ones are the ones that I'm inside the court and I'm going for more power if that's the shot that I'm hitting. Guys, we're going to take a one minute break just to tell you about the, the deals that we've got coming up in the next few days. It's Black Friday tomorrow, as you know. So we have four courses in four days and every day we're going to release a course with 50, 60 or 75% off the course, the normal price. So if you haven't done so already, go to our website at toptennistraining.com, sign up for the free videos and we'll email you the full details in the coming days. Yeah, so if you haven't done so already, there's a great opportunity for you to uh, to get one of our courses for you know a fraction of the price. Yeah. Uh, and you know there's going to be four courses out there every day. There's going to be one course released, um, and then you can have a look at that and uh, see what you think. We have a guarantee on it, so if you're not yep. satisfied, you know, guys, we're still friends, so you can yep. let us know, and uh, we'll make sure that uh, you know that's you're taken happy. care of. Where should you finish your swing on the forehand? Uh, you, there's five main forehand finishes that we cover inside our forehand blueprint course. Um, but the common one is the one over the elbow, uh, over the shoulder. So like somewhere classic, up here, yeah. that's the classic one. That's the one that you would teach to most beginners. The more advanced you get, you can also finish across the chest, more like a Federer kind of finish. But there are many different ways to finish the forehand. The main thing is that it's relaxed and that you have a proper follow through. Got a lot of good questions here, guys. Thank you for tuning in. And thanks for all the great questions. Why isn't there a player who can hit both forehands from both sides? Well, Simon can, so can. <laughs> he's, uh, he's, that's a player for you right there. I mean, I think the, the tough part is the grip change. Exactly. Right? The grip change is the, is the nightmare. If there was some way that you could do that better, I'd stick with two forehands. But right now, I haven't found that. Uh, there is some, some players on the Challenger. We, we saw that video a couple yeah. of days ago. of the Challenger player with two serves and two forehands. Eventually... There is a two-handled racket out there. Eventually, that might be something that you see a player doing on the tour. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah. I'm 16, I'm wanting to play college tennis. How many hours a week should I train? Again, you know, I used to train two to three hours a day of tennis, plus an hour of fitness. That's, I think that's if you wanna play to a good level, I think you need it. I think a lot exactly. of... A lot of players, they, 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 they don't realize that a lot of it is about kind of maintaining your timing, um, your rhythm on the strokes, and uh, you have to hit enough balls in order to be confident when you're hitting it. So, you know, all these guys, they've played a lot of tennis, and certainly the guys that are doing well in tournaments, they're playing even more tennis because yeah. they're staying in tournaments for longer, which helps them almost train during matches. Exactly. You know? And if you are a person that hasn't made it to the final, make sure that you're the person that trains really hard during those times because there's there are players out there in the world that are training very hard believe you me um and uh, yeah if you want to be able to compete against them you have to match them on the flip side i think until you're physically mature and physically at your at your peak don't overtrain so a lot of players they go to academies around the world and they spend eight hours on court and then they become very good ball strikers but they don't actually become good match players and it's a balance between playing the tournament, playing the matches and training. Like Alex has said, if you've lost at the tournament, 
don't spend the next five days enjoying the, the scenery. Go out on court, train, but also keep it at a level that your body can actually sustain. So um, we, had, we had someone here just ask an interesting question. Um, so what are the tips on building good mental toughness? I'd Ooh. say for me personally, again, it's that playing matches. Yeah. Putting yourself out there into uncomfortable situations uh, because that's when your mental toughness gets tested, right? You, you know, you need to play against, you know, players that are going to test you and you need to play in, uh, in, in, in those pressure scenarios. So whether it's a drill that you're doing where you're um, putting something on a drill, so either it's an outcome or a process. So if you're, you know, if, I ha if I'm working on a high follow through on my forehand and I haven't done it, you know, there's a penalty, there's something that I'm playing, you know, I, I get punished or I get rewarded for something that I do, I don't do, you know, so, you know, and, and that's when you're going to be at your most alert and that's when you're going to put the focus in to try and, to try and get better. But also if you're playing a match, you know, the, being in those tight situations, if you've done it enough, you're going to feel more relaxed. You're going to feel like, okay, I've done this and you have that kind of uh, ability to think, right, you know, I can get through this again. Whereas someone who is not experienced, who hasn't been in those tough situations, they might be a little bit more nervous and that, you know, those are the situations where the more experienced player usually wins. So definitely play a lot of matches and don't be upset if you've lost a few tight ones because exactly. sometimes it's those losses in the tight match scenarios where you actually learn and you come back strong. You know, it makes exactly. you stronger when you lose a, tight, a tough match because it takes a lot of grit and a lot of mental toughness to come back and train and get back into it. And, and that kind of com coming back, it makes you stronger and makes you better. And one thing that I found really helped me was actually the harder I trained physically and the, the fitter I felt and the stronger I felt, mm -hmm. the tougher I also felt mentally. It was almost like I felt like I, I deserved to win yeah. because I worked harder than the opponent. And that was something that really carried over in my tennis into my coaching with all the players that I coach. I try to make them work harder in training than will actually happen in a match. So that when the match starts, it's actually quite, compared to training, it's easier. So someone asked, what do you do on a, when you're having an off day in training? Uh, and that happens a lot, you know, you're, happens you're, it happens all the time. Um, for me personally, I always try to get something out of the session, you know, there's no point you being on court and not putting in 100% because you exactly. feel like you're not playing well. So what I try and do is I try and focus more on the process rather than the outcome. So if you're thinking you're playing not well, it could mean you're missing balls, right? You're missing in there, you're missing high. So I try and work really hard physically so I, I make sure that I improve my footwork I make sure that I get a, a sweat going I make sure that I'm the the top like the toughest working player on the court when I leave a session and at least if I haven't played well at least I know I got that out of that session that I actually worked on my fitness and I worked on getting to the ball like in the best possible way because that's your uh, you know that that's depending on you you know you're, you you can't, you're not the, you, can't, you can't know whether you're going to play well or not right exactly. it's almost out of your hands sometimes you just don't play well you know but you can it is dependent on you how hard you work so if you come out on the court and you work hard you know you can cut, go away from that session and feel like you've got something out of it and i think that will also resonate in your matches when you go into tournaments because you'll feel like okay actually you know i didn't just walk off a session when it got tough i stuck with it and i got something out of it and and i, I deserve to be here Hey Naz, mental preparation is as important as physical. Definitely agree with that. So, what are the, got a few more questions up here. What are the best double strategy uh, tips? Well, uh, I think players that move around at the net a lot are tough to play. I think yes. uh, if you're stationary, you you can get into this trap of uh, uh, you know letting the match pass you by almost you know you get exactly. cold you, you're not you, you can make you feel not involved so if you watch all the best doubles players they move a lot around the net that means poaching that means coming across uh, and uh, and that makes you feel part of the match and it also will make you uh, play better so uh, definitely work on your positioning but also work on the movement uh, getting to the ball and cutting into positions what to consume when losing energy and focus during games. So for me, I used to use a lot of uh, energy drinks, so Gatorade, something that replenishes the electrolytes, plus a banana. Sometimes I'd even eat like a chocolate bar in the middle of a match, just one or two small pieces every break, just to keep my sugar levels high and actually able to fire through a match, especially if I was playing three or four matches 
in a row or in a consecutive days. How so, do you... Wait, sorry, hang on, let me just... I might put a link... Oh no, I can't do that. I was going to try and put a link in there for you, for you guys to come and to have a look at. We have actually a, a course that we're um, advertising right now. It's a, the, a drills course. Yep. So if you, are learning, if you want to do more drills for your tennis, um, we have a course especially for that. We have a few drills that we uh, work on ourselves in our training, which can help you with your game, uh, which you can get for a fraction of the price right now. Exactly. So if you haven't done so already, uh, check us out. Do we have a link somewhere that we can send them to? How are we gonna? We haven't done this live stream on uh, YouTube, so yeah. this is so our first actually, time. If you haven't done it, look us up on Facebook right now. So go to our Facebook page, like our Facebook. Exactly. And on our Facebook, we have the Learn More button under the, the main title there, uh, where you can actually go and have a look at that course right now. So if you haven't done so already, have a look at our Facebook page, uh, and from there, usually when we make releases, you'll be able to see that. Straight arm forehand or bent arm forehand? That's a great question. I uh, do a bent arm, don't I? You do a bent and, arm, and, and I do, do more pretty much straight. Um, I think it comes down to each person. So one way isn't better than the other way. There's been great forehands, Fernando Gonzalez, he had double bend, bend in the wrist, bend in the elbow, he hit one of the biggest forehands of all time. Federer, he's got probably the best forehand of all time. He hits with a straight arm. So test both. Once again, it's about testing and trying an error with yourself and see which one works for you. Someone just asked, is it, you know, with the jump rope, is it good to, you know, to do skipping? Um, definitely. When I, was, when I was playing, definitely, you know, it's very good to, uh, uh, it improves your footwork, you know, it keeps you light on your feet. But something that I found, and actually it caused me to get injured, is I skipped a little bit too much. <laughs> um, I, I went a little bit overboard. I wanted to have the fastest feet in tennis, and I got injured because I skipped too much, and that constant kind of uh, impacting Grind. that impact yeah. on, the, on, the, on my knees, and I ended up getting uh, a knee injury, and I ended up having surgery because of it, and I think it was due to skipping too much. So skip, but don't overdo it. Don't go for too big a number because uh, you want to... It's not one. It's not one of these elements which you have to get better than the other guys, which yep. I found on my uh, on my own. Um, so yeah, make sure you do it, but don't 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 overdo it. How to start start a match strong? So the warm up is crucial. Hit before the match if you can. Uh, Thirty minutes, forty minutes. Some players like to do an hour. Uh, right before the match, make sure that you warm up so you're sweating when you come on court, so you're ready to go straight into the high uh, heart rate. And make sure that you're focused from the first point. Make sure that you know what you're trying to do in the actual match. If you know the opponent, have a game plan before. If you don't know the opponent, you're trying to figure that out in the warm-up and also in the first few games and take it from there. But the warm-up is crucial. I'd say also for me, I always try to start really aggressive. So with my game plan, so when I was going there, I was going in with my plan A and I was going to be aggressive and I was going to serve hard if I'm serving first or I'm going to be as you know as dynamic on the return and I try and I try and work really hard to have that you know that intensity to, uh, at the start you know and that's what's uh, what's important that you start with the with a right mentality that you know what you're doing you're not you exactly. don't just you're not just going through the motion you know so once uh, that you know that points the first points on you're, you're switched on and you're ready to go what is the worst tip that amateur coaches commonly give? <laughs> that's, a, that's a brutal one. Um, hmm, it's a tough one. I mean, recently when we, we talked about like not using your legs on the serve, for yes. example. Yep. We thought that, you know, that I think... You, there, is, there, is, there is some pretty bad coaching out there, but some of it works. And yeah. Every coach has their own methods. And, and sometimes what a, what a coach can also tell you um, might be their way of getting you to somewhere else in the process, you know, so it might not be the, the final product. So exactly. what, what could look like a, a bad tip might be a build up to something else, you know, exactly. so, uh, you know, if you're working on uh, your forehand and they say, okay, you need to use your wrist, just your wrist there, you know, you might think, well, no, forehands are not just with the wrist, but actually if you improve that part of the game and then incorporate it into your forehand, then it might make it better. So always discuss with your coach what is the actual end goal, what is the vision, and if you share that vision, then you go for it. You know, and I think that's important that you don't, exactly. you know, you don't dismiss it just because you're not sure of it, but you actually 
agree to the end goal and I think that's that's important got a couple more how to counter loss of motivation so how to motivate yourself when you're down um, I think always go back to your goals look at what you've goal planning is such a big thing in tennis and in any sport and in business so have goals have long-term goals have short-term goals and when you lose motivation go back to your goals and say okay I'm in this position now and I want to get to here how do I actually achieve it and plan out how you're actually going to get there and there's a lot of good videos on YouTube a lot of good videos on uh, Facebook for motivation and watch those like I watched quite a lot of those myself and it keeps you motivated keeps you energized and uh, remember your goals that's yeah, the key so, so, so for me like the goals definitely and it has to be kind of short-term goals and achievable goals yes you know we get confidence from uh, from 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 hitting our goals so if your goals and you're not reaching them your goals might be too high exactly. you need to set a goal that you can achieve and you can get used to achieving those goals because that's what's going to give you confidence um, and 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 in terms of like on a in a long-term scale it has to be about your dreams so if you have a dream of for me was you know playing Wimbledon for example if that's my dream then that dream will keep me going no matter what no matter how hard it gets you know exactly some goals might not mean so much if I say to myself right my goal is to get 10 balls in a row over the service line it's a goal but um, it might not mean that much to me so because it doesn't mean so much to me I might not want to wake up in the morning to achieve that goal but if my dream is to play Wimbledon and I know what that means and that feeling that it will bring then that might make me because I'll be like thinking, you know what, I have a dream and that's what I want to do. And then it'll, those goals then become more achievable. So I think that's, that, that's how you can break that down. And one more thing to add, it would be also to visualize, to visualize yourself in that, achieving that goal. And something that a lot of players do, they visualize themselves winning Grand Slams. They visualize themselves beating a rival. And that drives them, that gives them that motivation to carry on. So visualization is a very powerful tool and it's something that any tennis player should use. That was one here about Del Potro. I'm starting to hit better when I take my racket back like Del Potro for a forehand. Pointing the racket down before contact like Federer. Is there a reason for this? Uh, you wait, might wait. have more lag. So, I'm saying to you better if I take my racket back like the portal for a forehand swing instead of pointing the racket down, okay. So when you have the racket face level, you don't have much racket lag. So racket lag is basically leverage in the arm and the, and the racket. The higher you keep the racket above the grip, the more lag you're gonna have. So you'll get more power, you'll get more control, you'll get more spin. Federer does achieve that position, but then he drops the racket. However, he has firstly achieved that position. So all players have lag, or most top players have lag on their forehand, and it's something that most players should work to get. If given the choice at the beginning of the match, should you choose to serve or receive? Um, I think it's different depending on who you're playing, the conditions, how you're feeling with your serve, are you confident? If you're not that confident, you might want to receive first, and win that, try to break serve from that first game and get yourself in the match. I think per personally, like if I'm playing a big server, um, I try to serve first because yep. I feel like uh, they're gonna be holding serve most of the time. And when it gets to 5-4, they're gonna be 5-4 up against you and you're gonna be facing that pressure. Whereas you'd rather be 5-4 up against them where they're now facing that pressure of staying in the match and those are the times when a player will tend to get a bit nervous, get tighter, maybe their serves won't go in as much. So for me, against a big serve, I used to serve first. Uh, if, um, if I'm feeling like I'm, not, I'm a little bit nervous, as Simon said, I, want, I would give myself some time to play myself in a little bit and it gives you that one game. And sometimes that first game is when a player is not warmed up. If your exactly. opponent hasn't warmed up, that's also a great time to break. Um, so I'd say I always received uh, if I could, unless I played a big server, which is when I served. And that's how uh, I always tried to do it, and it, yep. it seemed to work. Had a couple more questions there. How to improve touch for drop shots and drop volleys. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that, but feel tennis and, and games that include feel 
that's the best bet. So we've got some of the videos there on our website. So once again, if you haven't done so, go and visit our website. The link is on the main channel, the main uh, channel page. Sign up for any free course. So that's anything that we ask you for the email address. Once you're on that list, we send you free videos and you'll get those videos as soon as we release them. Guys, if you haven't done so already, please share this video. Exactly. We'd love to for more people to watch it. Maybe it will help someone else with their game. Um, if you haven't done so, please press the share button and share it on Facebook, share it on your social media profiles. Um, it helps us a lot, you know, and exactly. a little thing like this, maybe some of your friends might want to watch us. Uh, they might like what we do. Um, and yeah, for us, it, it means a lot to have you guys share our stuff. So uh, please do that. Let's do some predictions for 2018, Alex. Yes. Who do you think will be number one this time next year? This is, Ooh. I'm just throwing it right out at you. Um, I'm going to say Federer. Federer? Yeah, I think he's got one more big year. And I think the next year is the one. Um, and I think... I don't know if Rafa is going to be fit enough. I think his knees... Stand the whole year, yeah. Yeah, I think his knees are going to be feeling it now. I think Murray's still not great with his hips. I think, I think Djokovic might be back. But I don't know if he's played enough uh, tennis uh, to, you know, make it to make it to that to that level you know I don't I think he's gonna almost need to play himself in um, so yeah I'd say Federer as number one and I think someone like uh, Zverev or yeah someone like Zverev or even Dimitrov who's been playing really well recently could uh, could challenge but uh, I think Federer is gonna be there do you think Agassi can change Djokovic's game uh, yes I think he'll make Djokovic play a lot more aggressive, a lot closer into the baseline like he used to when he was dominating. And I think he'll also tell him to shorten the point. Try to kind of take a, a page out of Federer's book where Federer is shortening the points, coming in more and finishing the points with volleys. I think in the next three or four years we'll see a lot more players attacking the net to finish points quicker. Okay guys, we'll go for two more questions. First come, first served. <laughs> Good strategies for matches, set plays. Uh, set set plays. Yeah, set plays. We have a we have a course on that. So exactly. Look out for that one. Uh, what what other tennis YouTube channel do you think gives the best tennis lessons? Our one. Our one. Uh, <laughs> Both our. <laughs> All right. Let's <laughs> see. Favorite string to use. Uh, I mean, I used Signum Pro for a while when I played. I really like the Luxalon Big Banger, Alley yeah. Power, uh, Alley, uh, Big Banger Original. Um, those are quite good strings. Um, the RPM Blast from Brabalat is pretty good. Uh, so those are all pretty good strings. I mean, I tend to use more polyester strings. The players that are using Synthetic Gut was a good string called Prince uh, Synthetic Gut Duraflex, which was quite popular among a lot of players. And now they have so many new strings coming out. Like I, I almost struggle to uh, uh, keep to up keep with pace it. with it. So yeah. yeah. Um, how do you hit more flat with Western grip? So the Western grip, obviously, you're going to have the racket face facing down a lot more. So you have to be uh, a lot closer to the ball, and you have to extend forward with that ball. So your your racket face has to be flat onto the contact. Therefore, you need to make sure that you get close enough so the ball is high enough for you to do it. Because obviously, the lower the ball, the more you have to brush up. So you make sure the contact is high enough and try and extend through it. Okay guys, last question. One more we're gonna take. We're gonna take an interesting one, something that stands out. Guys, thank you for tuning in. Let's have one more good question. Thank you as well for tuning in guys. Separate index finger, hundred percent. Yes. yes, I think it, it helps you. It helps you one. Um, if I if I hold it as a fist when I'm when I'm holding the racket, it makes you a lot tighter. So you hold it more. You hold on to the racket a lot more. You have a lot more control when you separate that finger. So that gap is very important. It helps you be loose on the racket. It helps you keep control of the racket. And it actually helps with reach as well. So you're able to like do kind of flickier shots rather than having to arm every shot. So yes, 100% separate that finger on actually, on, well, on all, this, all yeah. the strokes actually. In tennis, that's what we, uh, what we do. 
Will Feller retire in 2018? No. No? No, no chance. What if he wins all four slams? He won't. All three slams? He doesn't want Rafa to beat his record, so I wouldn't. But if he wins three him. slams and Feder- and Feder- uh, Rafa only wins one, yes. the French, Federer wins Aussie, Wimbledon, US, he's already at yeah, 22. Yeah, it doesn't matter. So he's still, uh, Rafa might still have a few years, so I think he'd, he'll play as long as he can. And as long as he's <laughs> competitive, he's still playing. When so. Rafa retires, Federer retires I the th- next day. I think so. I think so. Don't, you know, don't count him out just yet. All he's right, guys. He's a legend, isn't he? Thank you for watching. Um, I hope you enjoyed our live session. We haven't yep. done one of these. Ever, I don't think. Um, we'll try and do a lot it, more. It was fun to hear from you. It was fun to listen to some of your comments, some of your uh, questions. Yep. Uh, we certainly try to answer as many of you as we can. If we miss some of you, we're sorry. Uh, we, you know, we'll do it again. Yeah. We'll we'll do it again. So do stay uh, up to date with our channel. Make sure that you. Thanks a lot. It means Thanks, a guys. lot. We do try. Uh, make sure that you uh, visit our website. Put your email in so we can email you. So when we have something new, something interesting, something fun, like the other day I uh, we emailed a story that you know when I played yeah. against Andy Murray and Simon sometimes emails a story when he was coaching someone and something interesting has happened. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of content out there and some interesting things that you'll learn. So if you haven't done so already, visit our website uh, and uh, leave give us your email and we'll we'll send you uh, whenever something interesting comes around. See you guys soon. All the best. Thanks a lot, guys.